So tonight we're going to talk about real property rights and interests. So when I just mentioned property rights, interests, what kind of things come to mind? Property rights and interests, two different kinds of things. So when you buy a piece of property, what do you assume that you can do with that piece of property? Live. Live, use it, fix it up. Pitch a tent. Pitch a tent. Use it the way you want. Sure. Say no trespassers. Yeah. All those kind of things. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. Pretty much landscape. Do whatever you want. Paint your house if, unless you live in a subdivision that has rules about what you can do. So those are your property rights. Um, and interests, we talk about what we're going to talk about too is easements. When you have to cross over somebody's property, when you do different things like that. And where I've gotten into a lot of the easement rights is in what I do today is shopping center management. But shopping center management, we have lots of easements, cross easements across parking lots, across developments, and things like that. I manage a shopping center in Huber Heights in North Dayton. It was built in 1992, and there's 450 pages of easements and REA agreements. And it goes back, and Staples is on an out parcel, and they have an easement. And it's a little 20, 30-page document that says how their easement is established and that they have to pay us so much money every month for the right to drive onto our property to get to their property. They're not off the main pipe. They have to drive down on our ring road to go over to their property. And this lease started, or easement, it's not even a lease, it's an easement, started out paying $100 a month in, back in 1994. And then every five years, it goes up by 15%. So when I found it, I'm sitting there going 100 times 115, five years, doing calendars to schedule to see what their monthly today. It's $174 a month. Um, so they, that's what they have to pay for their, to be able to use our ring road because we have to maintain paved snow removal and all that on the ring road. So that's it's fair to ask for that. So and that, it's a commercial application, but we're seeing the full use of an easement, how it operates, and what happens with it. When you see houses that have panhandle lots where there's this little lane in this house sits behind another house, well, they've got an easement to be able to have their driveway literally cross that property in front of them. So we're going to talk about those easements. The other thing we're going to talk about with, with property rights and interests is the fact that property is multi-layered. When I talk about multi-layered, what, what does multi-layered mean to you? Like a cake? Yeah, totally. Okay. That, yeah, there's icing, there's the cake, there's the filling. So when we think about land, we have our air rights, that's the icing. We have everything grown on the ground. We can do uh, the trees, we can do crops, we can remove soil. We actually can, literally builders want to pull soil off property to take it to another property to build up a property. So if we have a high ground, we can sell our soil. We can do all kinds of things with the top level. Then we have the earth itself, which we put our foundation, our footers for our houses and everything into. Then we go below the earth. So below the earth, we get minerals. We get other things below the earth. So they're all different layers that we can sell, that we can do easements with or license agreements or different types of contracts with to do those things with. So we're going to talk about all those things tonight when we talk about all these rights and interests. Okay, so we're going to talk about air rights and the right to review. What gives somebody the right to review? I worked for these guys when I managed the old Enquirer building downtown. They were New York developers, and they had this building called 77 Water Street down in Manhattan where they had the view of the river. Somebody came in and bought the property between them and the river and built a high-rise, blocked all their view. They sued them they, to try to stop the construction. They didn't win. They didn't get any damages because what we learned in this whole process is you don't control what isn't yours. The laws control how it gets developed, but you don't control that property across the street or that neighbor's property next to you. You don't own it, so you don't control it. Um, but we have air rights, and we have the rights to review, and we're going to talk about how that's established. Rights to extract oil and gas. Um, we're going to talk about land issues relating to alternative energy. And this is, that's part of the reason why I wanted this textbook. Older textbooks don't talk about alternative energy. But it's coming. It's, it's headed this way now. So what kind of alternative energy sources as residential homeowners are we going to try to use? Solar. Solar. 
wind, geothermal. And there's a lot of different things we can try to do. And what's our right to be able to do this? That geothermal. Let's say your yard isn't quite long enough to install those hoses. Now, now we can do vertical things, but they used to be pretty much horizontal. And you'd have to install those hoses in the ground. Now they're more vertical, or you can make your own what you want to do with it. But what gives you the right? How would you get that land if you didn't own it? Um, we're going to talk about lateral support rights. You know, the property right next to yours, there's a, there's a, a retaining wall. It, the retaining wall is on your property. What are you supposed to do to maintain that retaining wall to support their property? What are your requirements? When you buy a property, you've got a retaining wall. What, do you, what should you be asking? What kind of neighbors do I have? Are they good to maintain? Are they taking care of stuff? Because you don't want to move in and have neighbors that you got to sue to get them to maintain something they're supposed to do, not where you want to go. The right to use water, owner's right to divert surface water. We're going to talk about the water rights, how we talk about riparian rights, how water rights evolved over time, what we have east of the Mississippi, what we have west of the Mississippi, and water rights. And you'll appreciate things going on in California and the desert areas right now where they're having some dry spells, how they've got to regulate water usage, where that comes from. The right to divert water, service water, private and public nuisances, everything you want to know about nuisances, and then also the law relating to trespassers. So those are just a lot of little topics we're going to get into tonight. Okay, so land owner's rights. When you have a piece of property, you assume that you're going to have air rights, you're going to have water rights, you're going to have mineral rights, you're going to have the geothermal resources, you have wind power, you enjoy the land free of nuisances, you can exclude trespassers. And then again, you have lateral and subadjacent support rights to the land. So again, when we talk about buying a piece of real estate, we're buying not only the real estate, the building, and the land on it, but we're buying this figurative thing called a bundle of rights. We're getting this kind of, like I said, a piece of paper or the paint brushes or the collective sticks of the bundle of rights that says that we have rights to do things, things with our land. And this is where the law comes in, is how these things are interpreted. So air rights, the rights to develop airspace located above the surface of the earth. So we have different air interests. Air space is divided into two areas. We have the column lot and the air lot. And then we can also do something called transferable development rights with our air rights. Air rights. Um, how many of you are familiar with Fort Washington Way in Cincinnati? When you drive down I-71 and you go under the city, you're going through Fort Washington Way, the big tunnel. It's the only big tunnel we have in Cincinnati. Uh, I, I've been to other places and, and I've seen big tunnels, really big tunnels. But we have this tunnel in Cincinnati. If you pay attention, what is above that tunnel? Air. But what's what's actually above it? Downtown. Is hmm, think about Columbia Parkway comes into downtown. We have the 4th Street Apartments. It goes over down around the bend, Pike Street, 4th Street. So those 4th Street Apartments are actually built on the air rights of the tunnel. They have a deed, but they don't own the core all the way down because the tunnel runs under the apartments. So in Cincinnati, you say, hey, this is weird. In Cincinnati, we don't think of these concepts of air rights and building on top and top of something. But if you live in New York and Chicago, in LA and dense major cities, those things are going on all the time. People are building on top of other people's rights. In downtown Cincinnati, at the corner of 7th and, 7th and Walnut, I think CVS is a tenant in the lower level of that building. There's a seven, eight-story garage, and then above that is an office building. That garage is a separate piece of parts. It's a separate building, separate owners from the office building. The people in the office building have built on air rights. We don't have a lot of those split interests in Cincinnati. We only have a few of them, but I know a few of them because of working in the different work I've done in Cincinnati. But it's really cool when you think about how that all works. Again, we're, we're talking about the different layers, what we can do with them, how we can sell them off. So where we live in the most suburban or community neighborhoods, what happens to the air rights above us? Not much. Who owns the air rights above us? Up to up to what the FAA controls. Exactly. Where planes can land, fly, do things like that. 
Guess what? The closer you live to the airport, the lower that threshold is. Why is that? Because planes are taking off or landing, depending upon which side of that airport you're on. Okay, so I live real close to Lunkin Airport. I'm on the Fairfax side, which is the coming in side, which is better, less pollution than the takeoff side. Most people, when they take off from Lunkin, they're going over the river and out. But so in our neighborhood, we were concerned about, there's an elementary school, now it's a middle school, but we're a little concerned about that Lunkin Airport becoming more of a public airport than what it is. It's kind of a private airport, but, but believe it or not, Lunkin Airport was Greater Cincinnati's first airport. But in the 60s, they built something over in Cincinnati called the Greater Cincinnati Airport. Why we land in Kentucky and we drive that. Anyway, so our Greater Cincinnati Airport is actually in Kentucky. But those of us that live around Lunkin want to stop any kind of Southwest Air or anything like that coming in there, commercial flights coming in, because we don't want to have more planes landing over our head. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to. Literally, I can count the things going over the top. They're not quite that low, but they get pretty low. And then the concern is if they crash landing, they, they're going to land in our community, in our neighborhood. It's not the safest place you want to be. Yesterday, I got the experience of flying to Chicago and back, so I could appreciate this whole story. I'm telling you, as I'm sitting in this little plane going, dang, this is pretty neat that it actually you should take off, off and land. No, no, no. I thought about doing a Lunkin flight, but no, it, they're uh, expensive. Convenient. Yeah, very convenient, but they're expensive. So I flew out of Greater Cincinnati. But it's this whole thing about how do we control that? Who controls that? As citizens, we have the right to go and say, hey, we don't want any more development. We don't want to see that happening. Everybody around Lunkin that oversees Lunkin hears the noise from Lunkin objected to Lunkin becoming a, com a commercial airport. They like the fact that it's a small private airport. The president can land now and then. And the president does, but they got to get special landing rights because it's only so long. So we have this thing called air rights. Who controls it? How do we do it? And then the airspace, again, divided into the different areas so that we can actually sell off our rights. Transferable development rights. So we have in major cities where they have transferable development rights where they have the right to build over themselves, but they want it, they sell that off so somebody, to another owner or they transfer it somewhere else to another piece of property that they own give somebody the right to build higher. So read about that, and if you have questions next week, ask them. But you'll see some examples of that. Air rights. Again, we assume that we have the right to sunlight and views. So absent an easement, common law, or statutory right, landowners not have the right to sunlight or views. You can never assume that. We want to assume it all the time, but we don't. And in many states also recognize the right to solar energy. Can you build that solar farm collection point and not have somebody put up a shade structure right next to you that would stop the light from coming into it? Okay, so I live in a perfect house to do solar on my roof. I've looked at doing it maybe. Um, I don't, I'm not concerned that the neighbors are going to build, but they could add a full second story to their house instead of the, the slope roof. They could box it in. That happens in our neighborhood. If they box it up, it could actually cut some of the sunlight I get on my roof. So it's something I have to take into consideration before I make the investment in doing solar. Is that something I'm really concerned about? What's the potential for that? How do I protect my rights? Well, I can protect my rights by doing the easement or license agreement with my neighbors that would stay with the property. So mineral rights. We have oil and gas rights. My learning process of mineral rights when I was in the trust department, I managed a lot of properties around Kentucky, Virginia, and Ohio that had mineral rights. We were getting mineral leases that started in the 1930s and 40s. We were still getting payments on these mineral leases. And so the mineral rights are property subsurface rights. They can be sold separately. And what they were done is they were with leases. That These leases would go on 40 or 50 years and they'd be renewed. And these companies kept strip mining or deep mining or getting oil out of the ground. And then they were paying the trust department, paying the trust property owners the fees. Um, when they're below the surface, minerals are considered real property that, because they're part of the earth, that real property thing. It's attached to the earth. And then once they're extracted, they become personal property. So when they're extracted, then we can sell them like any goods or services of their personal property. But you've got to go through that extraction process to do it. 
And most common subsurface rights are oil and gas. And also what we're seeing a whole lot of in eastern Ohio is something called fracking, where they're pushing water in the ground to get the gas out. It's not always the best and healthiest thing to do, but we're seeing, again, more in different ways to try to get that cheaper gas out of the ground. In real estate, we're not going to stop these things. What we do is we learn how to live with them, how to regulate them. So that's what we're learning the law about. Okay, so the rule of capture. This entitles the owner to the minerals that are captured from the owner's property, even if they flow to the well from beneath another's property. So the rule of capture is, the you know, they, I brought it to the surface. I brought it out of the ground. I captured it. Even though that oil was on my neighbor's property, I captured it. Therefore, it's mine. That's called the rule of capture. But we have two different theories that address this, the rights to actually be able to do this. It's ownership theory and non-ownership theory. You're going to read about that. And where this is a problem is when you're on the Ohio, West Virginia, or the Ohio, Pennsylvania border. Let's say you own property on those areas, and you are somebody that's doing this fracking, or you're mining your property. You've got two different states that have two different rules because every all these rules are state regulated. So Ohio has a, primarily, I think it's an ownership theory, but the other states have non-ownership theory. So again, you're going to read about how we're going to bring these, we capture them and who owns what. Not important in southwestern Ohio when we're selling real estate because we're not dealing with mineral rights here. But it would be very important if you were the realtor that was working on those, again, those farms or those big chunks of land on the border states where they are doing fracking and doing other things, digging for coal and, and things like that. And out west where they're doing coal mining and different things as well. It would be important to know what's going on with it. There's not going to be a whole lot of this on your law test. You'll need to understand that it exists. Not a lot of specifics about this on the state test. But you need to know that it exists. So we have this doctrine of correlative rights, which each landowner has a reasonable opportunity to extract a fair and reasonable share of production. They can't be piggies and take it all from everybody around them. And then we also have unionization of pooling prevents drillers from taking disproportionate amounts of underground resources. Again, where this is coming into play is active, where there's active mining going on. Where, and if you own these properties, it's a lot of money to be made from under your property. If you can expand on these, these leases and get paid literally for years. Alternative energy. So electricity or any fuel other than natural gas or petroleum would be called alternative energy. So what we're seeing is hydroelectricity. Um, think about the old little streams where people had the mills, the grist mill and things like that, but they had the paddle wheels in the water and they have the right to use the hydro energy. Old mills is where, you know, these are things that go back to the 17, 1800s where people were using this hydroelectricity type energy. We have wind energy, biomass, and by the way, wind, we're, we see these great big fans to, to create the wind energy. Today you can buy little teeny fans. They're getting smaller and smaller how they can take those little fans and make them spin and capture energy from natural wind. So we'll see more of those kind of installations, smaller, smaller kind of things. We're seeing solar power, smaller and smaller. They're saying pretty soon we won't need to have cell towers. We'll be able to take that cell tower technology and place these little pods on top of telephone poles. So we won't have to have these huge cell towers. So things are advancing. We have biomass energy. We have geothermal energy and then ultimately solar energy. So these are alternative energies that impact how we use, how we think about our real estate. Again, typical buying and selling of a house, you're not thinking about this stuff. But with a lot of the lead type stuff, geothermal, solar, wind, things we're seeing a whole lot in our greenhouses today the green homes that we're building. Okay, so this rights to supportive land. 
A landowner is entitled to have land supported in its natural state from the adjacent landowner's property. Okay, so we can't dig out our property and cause our neighbor's land to, to landslide. Because we wanted to put a swimming pool on our property. We dug it out. And we didn't have any care, concern about our neighboring property. If we want to put a swimming pool on our property, we have to engineer it. And we have to put in a retain wall to support their property. That's what this whole thing talks about. We can't just willy-nilly come in and say, ah, we're a swimming pool, we're going to dig it out. We have to be aware of what's going on on land around us. Anything we damage to our neighbor's land, we're responsible for. Doesn't mean we can't put this pool in. We can do it, but we have to support the land next to us. So we have lateral support and we have subadjacent support. And again, when we buy a piece of property and we see a retaining wall, is it our wall? Is it our neighbor's wall? Whose responsibility is it to maintain it? And are they doing a pretty good job taking care of it? Things you, a home investigator, somebody that's doing the home, you know, warranty type thing, looking at different things, the inspector, they don't always appreciate and realize they should, but they don't always look at these things. Water rights. The Ohio River is considered navigable water. So is the Little Miami and so is the Great Miami. And the reason we consider them navigable water, Ohio River obviously has large boats on it, but the Little Miami and the Great Miami have canoes and other crafts on them. They have different pooling areas where people can play on them. And they're considered navigable waterways. So when we talk about navigable waterways, we're talking about who has to take care of it, what's happening to it. We determined under four-foot factors, a test created by the Supreme Court, where the body of water is subject to ebb and flow of tide, whether it connects with a continuous interstate waterway, which Little Miami, Great Miami, connecting the Ohio River, which is definitely an interstate waterway. And by the way, it's called the Ohio River, but Ohio doesn't even own it. It's owned by Kentucky and other states. Um, it has navigable capacity and it's actually navigable. So states own the navigable waters. And what happened is when I was teaching this class a few semesters ago, I had a surveyor in the class and we were talking about who's responsible for maintaining that edge, cleaning it up. My daughter-in-law, they live in Loveland on the Little Miami River. And her family owns five acres on one side of the river there. So they're responsible for taking care and cleaning up that river the stuff that gets put on their property from the natural flow of the river, it's their garbage to clean up. Doesn't sound fair, but that's what Mother Nature does. She leaves things for them. So it's theirs to clean up and take care of. And they can post, if they want to, they can post no post, no trespassing signs on their piece of the river so that people don't come up onto the banks and take advantage of their property. That's their choice. Water rights like air rights are considered real property interests. Um, one thing you need to understand about water rights is water changes. The flow of water changes over time. Streams will flood and recede, but they can add land and take away land. Two different things happen as streams flow. So if you own a piece of property on a stream, and the stream bed is the marker of the dividing line, which it used to be in the old days because they didn't realize the water moved. Um, that may not be the true dividing line anymore, the property as they survey it today that we survey it. But again, understand that, that water adds and takes away from land. Riparian rights. The water belongs to those who own the land bordering the water course. So everything east of the Mississippi, as all the land was settled, um, farmers came in and said, we're, we're the landowner right next to the river, therefore we have the right to use it. We have the right to water our crops and our animals first before it flows to the next and the next and the next. The prior appropriation doctrine says no. First in time, first is the right to use the water over the later users. So as the west was being settled, people would come in. They determined that they wanted that to be their homestead, but they weren't right up against the water. But, but there wasn't anything between them and the water. So they went and they claimed the water. They created little channels and things like that so they could get the water. 
So that's this prior appropriation. So in the states where there's prior appropriation theory today, they file paperwork to get their water rights. Not longer do they live or own the property right next to the river, but now they file paperwork to get their water rights. And there's also things that says that we have to take care of the water rights of those downstream and those using the water around us. Surface waters originate from rain, springs, or melting snow. So we have the conduct rule, reasonable conduct rule, which is division, uh, the diversion of the surface water is allowed as long as the conduct is reasonable. So what would we divert water for? Either away from the foundation. Okay. We want to push it away from and protect our property, so we'll divert it. Why else would we divert water? Irrigation, Irrigation crops. Irrigation crops. What about the paper plants? All in, in Hamilton and Middletown and stuff. They use a lot of water to produce paper. So they were diverting it but pulling it in to their factories to use it. So we also have factories that need water. So how do we make the division? Who's allowed to have it first? Where does it go first? So that's a lot again. Who's on the river? Who's next to the river? What's prior appropriation? All these different things come into play as we think about. In Cincinnati, we take water very much for granted. We don't have water dry days and things like that here. We don't have to do it. Um, but in other parts of the country, they do. In, in California, they can't take a shower every single day in parts of California. We, we very much take that for granted because we have a great harvest uh, supply of water here, but it's you, you got to understand it's limited. Uh, Ohio doesn't have any natural lakes, with the exception of what's at the top of the state. So they're all man-made. Who's responsible for that? Corps of Engineers, maybe, or the landowners that owned or the developed. I mean, like Caesar's Creek and all those. All those are. I remember being a little girl going to Caesar's Creek, and we had to pay to go. So I don't know, you know, what what it is. And then when I look at and I drive across Caesar's Creek now, and I look down when I'm going up to Winsville, drive across Caesar's Creek. It's a pretty good sized creek, and now there's water. There's land, very valuable beachfront property on it. Um, I, I think it's Corps of Engineers that's responsible for taking care of it. I don't know. That makes sense. Look it up. Find it out. They, good question for you to find out. It, it was a good question. Let's figure out who's responsible for it. Yeah. Okay, so now we have this thing where that wonderful little Caesar's Creek overfills, floods, and it runs off downstream and does damage downstream. Who's responsible for that? There was something I was watching on one of the history channels we watched the other day about a dam out west. Or no, no, no. To Italy? It was a foreign country. Major flood. Or, and what happened was it was a major landslide. Mountain fell in on the reservoir. Caused a tidal wave. Went over the top of the dam. Flooded the towns below. Major damage. It literally wiped out these towns in the 30s and 40s. And I'm looking, this dam still exists. And my, my first thought was, dang, dang, the dam still exists. It didn't get damaged. They built such a structure. But who's responsible for that? That was Mother Nature. It, it's hard to push and, and force the blame on something like that. But somebody might want to. Might want to know about it. Because there's money to be paid to get uh, everything fixed, repaired. Groundwater is the water which flows underneath soils found in pores, cracks, and spaces between rocks and particles. And states differ on their ownership of groundwater. Again, all of these things we're talking about water, this will not be on your real estate test. I seriously won't see this on your test. But again, it's interesting things to know as you're dealing with the real estate. It's that passion about, oh, what if this and what about that? Nuisance. When I say nuisance, what's that mean to you? Problematic. Problematic. Somebody's not being respectful or not treating something right. They're just, you know, just not doing right by it. So we have substantial and reasonable interference with the use and enjoyments of another's land is what we call nuisance. So if somebody's loud, I can't enjoy my, my property in peace, the loud stereo blaring next door. If the loud car goes by, that's a nuisance. So there's two types of nuisance. There's private nuisance and public nuisances. And then we have the nuisance per se. It's an activity, act, structure, instrument, or occupation that is by its very nature and of itself 
always considered to be a nuisance. I can't think of what that would be right now except a garbage dump. It always smells. The pig farm always smells. Anybody that's around the pig farm is going to smell it. But hey, you're the pig farmer. You can't control that. But you had 100 pigs and now you got 1,000 pigs. Uh oh. <laughs> you do control it with the amount of pigs you have and the amount of farm, but you've always been a pig farmer. What's your responsibility to those neighbors around you? And you do know that's how Rumpy got started. Rumpy was a pig farmer. He was getting scraps for his pigs. He was collecting scraps from restaurants in Cincinnati. And then they kept saying, well, can you take our garbage? Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do that? So all of a sudden, Rumpke became this major garbage company. And now we have Mount Rumpke in more than just Cincinnati, more than just Colerain. They're all over the state because Rumpke has many locations now. But they start out as a pig farmer. And that stinks when you're near that. And people in Colerain Township, where that Rumpke, Mount Rumpke is, are always trying to do things to stop expansion or control the expansion. People who live around there don't like the smell. So do, does Rocky just get off because they say, oh, we're a nuisance per se? They, they have to do things to control it. They won't be able to stop it when Mother Nature is really making a strong windstorm. You can't stop it, but they do things to control it. So mitigate. To mitigate. Mm -hmm. That's why the real estate is like a lot cheaper the closer you live on Rocky. Mm -hmm. The closer you live to any kind of nuisance like that, the cheaper it's going to have an impact on the real estate value. Living right up against I-75. Okay, so I'm driving through Chicago. I, I kept going the wrong direction. I got lost a couple times and got late for my plane. Um, but and I keep thinking about all these highways and turnpikes, and there's all this real estate right there. In Ohio, we have it on the highway, but Ohio, I-75 actually cut through neighborhoods. The neighborhoods were here long before I-75 was. Then it was built and it literally chopped things in half. But today we have new developments that are right on the highway. New housing, new apartments. And I'm thinking, why would somebody want to live right on the highway and pay a high rent? But people do because it's convenient for location and things like that. But a highway is a nuisance. One thing you'll find when you're showing people real estate, if they Google Earth, this piece of real estate, before you ever get in a car and drive them around, but Google Earth and get the earth view, not just the map view, but get the earth view and let them look at that before they ever get in a car and drive around and see what the properties are all around it. And chances are 50% of the properties you want to go look at. Because they'll look at it and say, oh, I don't like that. If I'd known that was there, I wouldn't have done it. The lady who's my boss, her and her husband have a house in Rose, Rosemont, Illinois. I'm trying to sell it right now because she moved to Dallas. His backyard is a graveyard. Just, Again, he's lived there for years, but he was trying to spruce up his property. He cleaned out all of the overgrown bushes. The overgrown bushes hid the graveyard. And he was just trying to do the right thing to clean up his property. And, and Sylvia was telling me the other day, she says, I don't believe it. he did that. I do, I do believe he did it. But now people are saying, oh, they can see the graves now. They don't want to buy the house. It's like, okay, you know, what, where do you, what do you do here? Nuisance. So defenses, it's coming to the nuisance, is remedies, is monetary damages or equitable relief. So if the nuisance is something, again, what we were talking about has been going on for years, but if it's a nuisance, it's all of a sudden the courts can stop it, they can order stoppage of it, they can give monetary damages, or they can do equitable relief, make somebody pay for the problem. Landowners' duties to persons entering land. We have specific duties that owe to others based on status or category of persons entering land. Trespassers. What do we have to do for people that are trespassing on our property? <laughs> Don't shoot them in the back. Um, what was your comment? What was your comment? Huh? He said shoot. No, don't shoot them in the back. You can shoot them, but don't shoot them in the back. Because if you shoot them in the back, that meant they were going the other way. They were trying to, to, to flee. Shoot them in the front. Make sure, make sure it's in the front. Catch them. Um, but no, we don't have an obligation to trespass. My, my husband jokes he's got a, a, a rifle in our closet. If anybody hears him cock the rifle and they come up the steps, they deserve anything they get. Because that's an obvious sound for somebody who's breaking into your house. They know what the hell's going on. But as trespassers, we don't owe responsibility. However, when I'm 
work at Ohio Casualty, we're an insurance company, and we insure all kinds of liability. And we had a house, old farmhouse, as part of our real estate, the industrial real estate in Fairfield there. And that old farmhouse, we kept boarding it up, and it became what we called an attractive nuisance. Because kids used to keep coming breaking into it, and they have their little parties. And, and there's also rumors that Kiss owned the barns next to us and did some things. And, you know, so everybody was always up on the property trying to do things and investigate. Stuff. But it was called an attractive nuisance. As much as we boarded it up, we tried to stop problems. And the real issue there is if somebody was killed on the property, who's, who's, who's liable for that? Not only the person that killed it, but the person that owned the property because it was a vacant property. So they finally tore it down, but it took them many years to finally just say, the heck with it, we're going to tear it down. We don't want this problem anymore. It was a beautiful house, but they weren't going to sell it as a house anymore, so they tore it down. So it was an attractive nuisance, and so for child trespassers, as much as we post no trespassing, we have responsibility. <coughs> Licensees. Who is a licensee? What is a licensee? You buy a Reds ticket. You buy a concert ticket. You're the licensee. You're the person going to the game or the venue or the concert or whatever. The licensees, what do we owe them? We owe them a duty of care. We take care and maintain our property. But we only owe them that duty of care for the time that we've allowed them to become onto our property. So the Reds venue, that game. They're allowed to come in that afternoon for that game. They might be allowed to show up a couple hours early and stay a couple hours late. But they're only there for that day. They're not hanging out for this long period of time. So invitees are our guests. Those are our friends, our family, the people that we have over to our property. What do we owe our guests? Same kind of thing, reasonable care. Somebody trips and falls on your property, what are they going to do? If they're your friend, they're probably going to say, don't worry, I'm okay. Or they're embarrassed, I'm sorry, I just didn't mean to do this. But they get seriously hurt. They may come to you for monetary relief because they got to go to the hospital. They need doctor care. Something needs to happen. So that's why, as homeowners, we have something called general liability insurance. We have some protection to help us out. Because we can't stop everybody from suing us. But we have this duty to do reasonable care for our property. Last night I got home long flight. It was after midnight. And I came up the back steps. We built a deck on the back of our house. It's been around for a while. I came up the back deck and I pulled up. It's been a long day. I've been on a plane for hours. I drive home. I can barely get out of the car and walk at that point in time. I walk up steps. I'm using the railing to pull up. My rail broke. <laughs> My husband, when he got this morning, the rail was just laying there. It was late. It was after midnight. I just set the two by four down and kept walking up the steps. He didn't say anything to me yet. I'll figure out. We'll figure that out tonight when we have our discussion about the rail. Because then I touched it this morning and he left before me. But what did he do? He passed it back? No, no. He just laid it there. So probably by tonight he will fix it, he will fix it back. But again, so I'm a friend, I'm an invitee, I'm walking up, and I'm using this handrail, and it comes off, and then I fall. Whose responsibility is that? Homeowners. Me again, my husband would have said, what were you doing? You're so clumsy. <laughs> yes, I know I'm clumsy, but long day, long day. Okay, so that's it for this chapter. Any questions? You guys had some interesting...